Hello everyone. I'm taking you to space again tonight. Maybe you have come across the concept of giant spaceships that could carry humans to faraway destinations. So far away that the journey would take several generations. These ships are called generation ships. And of course, they only exist in fiction. But could they possibly really exist one day in the future? What are all the questions and challenges they raise? Technical challenges, but also biological, social or ethical. This is what we are going to explore tonight. I will tell you about theoretical designs of such ships that have been imagined over the past decades, and we will review the obstacles they would face and their possible solutions. So relax, make yourself comfortable, our little cruise to space is going to begin in a minute. I'll take just one minute of your time to draw your attention to two new projects that were launched a few days ago. First, there is the reboot of Lights Out Library, that is to say my stories retold in American English, now by Olympia. We launched it a few days ago, and I'm really enthusiastic about how it turned out. I think it sounds great, the atmosphere is on point, and I'm sure many of you will not regret it if you take a moment to check what it sounds like. And second, also with Olympia, we launched a Spanish version, La Biblioteca de los Sueños, which is the same concept, but in Spanish, with a Mexican accent. You can already listen to several stories of both shows on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and other platforms. We also have a YouTube channel. You will find links in the description and in the first comment pinned under the video, together with the timestamps for tonight's story. And now, take a deep breath. Let the tension go in your shoulders, and let's get started. To begin with, let me describe you the Enzman Starship, a concept for an interstellar ship from the 1960s. Imagine a long cylinder, 2000 feet long, that is 600 meters, with a giant ball at the nose, and eight engines at the other end, at the stern. The cylinder is 300 feet wide, 90 meters wide. The ball at the front is a gigantic tank of heavy hydrogen, of deuterium, that can be used as fuel for fusion reactions. And this hydrogen feeds the engines on the other side of the ship, where fusion reactions use it to liberate enormous energy and burning hot fusion products that are ejected and propel the ship at an inconceivable speed of almost 10% of light speed after several weeks of steady acceleration. The tank at the front of the ship contains 11 million tons of frozen deuterium, enough to ensure the ship's autonomy for several decades. Since the ship will not slow down by itself in space, this fuel is only required to make it accelerate and decelerate when it reaches its destination. For the rest of the journey, it only needs small impulses, 
to correct, to adjust its trajectory. In between the tank and the engines, there is this wrong cylinder. And this cylinder is made of three identical housing sections, identical for redundancy. If one section is compromised, the crew can move to another one. These modules can house 200 people each, and more of them could be added by making the ship longer. They could contain plants to renew oxygen and for food, a closed water distribution and a cleaning system, cabins, common spaces, everything the crew needs to survive months years, or maybe even decades, in complete autarky, traveling at high speed to a faraway star system. One problem with this design is the absence of gravity inside the ship. This is uncomfortable in the long term and can have serious effects on the passenger's health. So what about this other concept, proposed by NASA in the 1970s, that could be used to replace the housing modules on the Ensman ship, the Stanford Taurus. It consists of a torus, that is to say, a ring shaped like a donut, that could be about a mile in diameter, and would rotate quickly once per minute. This rotation would create an artificial gravity inside for the people near the edges of the torus due to the centrifugal force. With a bit more than a mile in diameter and one rotation per minute, this artificial gravity would be equivalent to about 1 g. That is to say, people would feel they weigh exactly the same as on Earth. This type of design was imagined for space colonies. The Stanford Taurus is just one example. The first rotating rings of this kind were conceptualized in the 1920s, long before any human-made object had traveled beyond the Earth's atmosphere. If space colonies like these, using a torus, were built, a system of mirrors could bring sunlight inside the ring, and an artificial atmosphere maintained by an ecosystem with plants could be created. So, if it is theoretically possible to live and travel in space, in a sustainable environment for years, why not for decades? Why not for centuries, if the passengers reproduced on board? How far could we go? And would it be better to let people live their lives on the ship, or somehow put them to sleep until they reach their destination? How risky could it be? What could be the effects of such a long time spent in space on people's health? How could a small society survive inside a metal structure for so long? A society in which people could be born and die in space, without ever seeing where their parents came from. Is that viable? And is that ethical? And also, how realistic are all of the various technologies necessary to achieve that, if we ever wanted to? That's a lot of questions. And we're going to examine them orderly. It all begins with a revolution for humankind. The dream of no longer being earthbound as a species and of, maybe, one day, inhabit other worlds. 
the idea that humans could one day colonize the solar system and beyond the galaxy is not something that recent. It appeared by the late 19th century, early 20th century, and it rose together with the realization of the distances between Earth and other bodies of the solar system, and even more, our solar system and other possibly habitable star systems. The closest star systems are several light years away from us, so theoretically, assuming it would be possible to come close to light speed, the journey to them would take a few years. But nothing says that a habitable planet could be found there. And at the scale of the galaxy, a few light years is uh, almost nothing. The diameter of the Milky Way, our galaxy, is about a hundred thousand light years. In other terms, a spaceship approaching light speed could uh, travel for a thousand years and only cross one percent of the galaxy. This is really not much. And traveling at light speed is very uh, theoretical for a human-made vehicle. First, because no propulsion system able to achieve this kind of speed has ever been conceived. And second, because with passengers inside, the acceleration and deceleration phases have to be managed carefully. You know that passengers inside a vehicle that is accelerating experience the g-force. Their mass is subject to a force that causes a perception of weight. This force is proportional to the acceleration. We have all experienced it in a very mild way in a car or a train, when they accelerate or decelerate. It is a bit more intense in a, a plane that takes off, or it can be very intense in a, a fighter jet, for example. But all these vehicles can only reach speeds that are very, very slow compared with light speed. The g-force continues to be felt for as long as the vehicle accelerates. It disappears only when its speed becomes constant. You experience this in cars or planes. Once the acceleration phase ends, the sensation of push on your body, of weight, disappears. So how long would it take to accelerate to light speed or close to it in conditions that are sustainable for people? The answer is several months at least. Assuming a 1G acceleration, which corresponds to a hundred meters per second of acceleration, it would take about a year to reach light speed. 1G is not too much, because in space our bodies have no weight, so a 1G acceleration would turn into the sensation that we keep exactly the same weight we have on Earth. It could create a kind of artificial gravity for as long as the acceleration continues. This entire year of constant acceleration could be reduced to a few months, accepting 2G, but that would be uncomfortable. The passengers would feel that their weight has doubled for an extended period of time. Now, this is all very theoretical, because we don't have any propulsion system that could uh, come even close to reaching light speed. The fastest ones imagined, using uh, nuclear explosions to propel ships, would uh, only reach a few percentage points of light speed, and they were never built. 
the fastest real object ever built by humans to date is a space probe, the Parker Solar Probe, which reached a speed of 690,000 kilometers per hour, or 430,000 miles per hour. This is about 700 times faster than a commercial flight at cruise speed. It is really fast. But it is still only 0.06% of light speed. It would need to fly 1500 times faster to reach light speed. So, as you see, possible habitable worlds, or at least exoplanets we would want to go to, are many light years away from us. We can only reach speeds that are way below light speed, and the consequence of these factors is easy to understand. Any travel to another star system would take, at the very least, decades, and more likely several generations or centuries, longer than a human's life. Either a kind of journey by teleportation, of uh, instant travel, a space jump is discovered one day, assuming it is possible, which is far from sure. We are not anywhere near understanding and achieving this. Or, if humans really want to colonize other star systems than ours, they will have to accept very long travels journeys that last several generations. And to do that, either the passengers are put into a state of suspended time during the journey. Here again, we are already familiar with this concept. There are plenty of science fiction movies in which people are put in cryosleep, in a kind of coma, inside a pod, Sci-fi has used this device for decades, so much that it is not even explained anymore. But in reality, there is no such technology on the horizon. I will also come back to this later. Or, if people are not put to sleep, and the effects of aging cannot be prevented, they will have to live on the ship for centuries. This would mean that all the passengers who would depart would die long before arrival, maybe their children too, and only their descendants, several generations down the line, could reach the intended destination. This is the concept of generationship. Are we likely to see one before we all die? Probably not. Generation ships raise a long list of technical, human, and uh, ethical problems. Many of these problems have uh, theoretical solutions, but the list of issues is so long that it is hard to imagine one could be built and sent away in the foreseeable future. Starting maybe with the first problem. At this point, we wouldn't know where to send a generation ship. The existence of another planet in the galaxy where humans could live freely with an atmosphere that is breathable, temperatures that are livable, about the size of Earth, for the gravity to be similar at its surface, all of these conditions are possible somewhere. But we are unable to detect such a planet. No probe has ever found one, nor reached another star system for that matter. From afar, we have identified a lot of exoplanets, some of them with characteristics that could possibly make them habitable by humans. They have about the right distance to their star, they are rocky, with a solid surface. 
We have basic hypotheses about their composition, but that's all we know. Even assuming that a ship with humans reached one of them, the odds are that they would find a desolated rock with conditions at the surface that are very hostile to human survival. So, before any generation ship is sent out, we would need at least probes to explore this planet, with all the time it takes to travel there and send back information. Another point is that if it is additional space for the human race that we need, it would be so much more cost-effective and feasible to just colonize inhabited parts of Earth, like under the seas or in deserts and polar regions, or even in space colonies in orbit around Earth, rather than send out a few hundreds or thousands of people to another star system. But let's leave that aside and imagine humanity wants to colonize other worlds, that have somehow be identified, and decides to embark on the project of sending out a generation ship. What would it take? First, it would need to provide an environment to the passengers that would be entirely self-sustaining, with life support for everyone on board, energy, water, oxygen, food, clothing for several generations. A lot of recycling would be necessary, but the purification of water, or the recycling of fibers, is something that looks technically feasible with our current technology. The bigger question here is, can we create a small artificial closed ecosystem? And we can get interesting information on this point thanks to an experimental facility called Biosphere 2, which opened more than 30 years ago in Arizona. Biosphere 2 was initially designed as a research center consisting of a closed ecological system, a vivarium, inside which researchers would try to live with no exchange at all, no food, no air, including no oxygen, with the outside, after the doors had been sealed. So it worked like a space colony could work, minus the risk of dying in case of an accident. The only thing it received from the outside was sunlight, something a space colony in orbit of a planet or orbiting the sun could also receive. Biosphere 2 was used twice for its original intended purpose as a closed system experiment, once from 1991 to 1993 just after its opening, and another time for six months in 1994. The crews that went to live inside the system had different domes with glass walls to receive sunlight, and these big sealed greenhouses contained different biomes, that is to say different ecosystems different biological communities of plants and small animals, like insects, replicating the biomes that can be found under different climates on Earth. There were five of them, including a rainforest, a savanna grassland, or an oceanic biome with a coral reef. They also had living quarters, a workspace, and an agricultural area to grow food. So these biomes produced oxygen for the inhabitants, and also for the domestic animals included in the agricultural area. 
They had a few goats, 35 hens, fish grown in a pond. This experiment had been very thought out, and yet it ran into trouble or produced mixed results. The first time, between 91 and 93, the eight participants survived and fed themselves successfully. But food was scarce, and they reported a constant sensation of hunger during the first year. Of course, they rationed themselves, because they knew they could only eat the surpluses they would produce, to ensure the viability of their mission. Many plants and animals included in the experiment died off. This had been anticipated. They opted to pack a lot of species at the start, in a relatively small space, to also study which ones would make it. But part of the reduction in the number of species was due to the relatively small size of the ecosystems. The rainforest was 20,000 square feet, that's 1,900 square meters. That's about the size of a regular supermarket. The agricultural area was a bit larger, at 27,000 square feet. That could sound reasonable, but real ecosystems on Earth are generally much larger than that which offers more opportunities for species to survive, be they plants or animals. Even if we understand well how an ecosystem works, it is not easy to create and maintain a miniaturized version of it, because the smaller it is, the more likely it is that a single unbalance can affect it deeply it loses some of its self-regulating properties. So, all ecosystems inside Biosphere 2 were affected by that. And on the other hand, pests like cockroaches prospered and tended to occupy more space in the food chain at the expense of other species. Oxygen levels were also problematic, not deadly, but the atmosphere that was sustained inside had relatively low levels of oxygen. As you know, green plants tend to be net producers of oxygen, thanks to photosynthesis. They use solar energy to break down carbon dioxide molecules in the air. They use carbon for themselves, and they reject oxygen. But at night, when there is no solar light, they breathe and they consume oxygen. They also live in ecosystems with animals that are consumers of oxygen. So the reality is that on Earth, if you consider forests as a whole, as ecosystems with their animals. Forests are of course very useful to store carbon, to protect animal life and biodiversity, and produce resources, but they are not huge providers of oxygen in net terms. They produce some, but they also consume a lot. For example, the Amazon forest is sometimes called the lungs of the earth for its important oxygen production and it does produce a lot of oxygen but with all the fauna that it harbors not just birds or mammals or reptiles think of all the insects and the worms in the ground plus its own consumption at night the Amazon barely rejects a net oxygen balance into the atmosphere. Something that is uh, much more critical to oxygen production on Earth are the oceans. They make two-thirds of our oxygen, thanks to the algae and bacteria 
that live on photosynthesis near their surface. Inside Biosphere 2, they had an oceanic biome, which covered 4,800 square feet, that's 450 square meters. And it certainly helps with oxygen production. But consider this. The oxygen production for eight people and the animals living with them was just sufficient with a surface of plants and water covering tens of thousands of square feet, thousands of square meters. Something closer to the surface occupied by a small stadium than the surface of a laboratory for only eight people. If we want to send hundreds to a self-sustaining environment in space, what kind of surface is going to be necessary then? Arguably, this huge surface could be reduced, maybe dramatically, with other oxygen production facilities. One could imagine green algae farms stacked vertically, maybe. But this tells us that oxygen production is not something that can be fixed with a few trees or aquariums, like it seems to be in some sci-fi movies. In reality, it would require a lot of space. It is extremely delicate to keep miniaturized ecosystems alive and well for an extended period of time. So, the biological difficulty here should not be underestimated. Food was another problem the participants had to deal with. Thanks to the diversity of crops in their agricultural area, and the animals providing milk and eggs, they survived without asking for outside help. In the 1991-1993 to 1993 experiment, the first one, the one that lasted longer, they still lost 16% of their body weight in average during the first year. But their weights stabilized or even increased a bit in the second year. So the balance here doesn't look that bad. Their bodies had to adjust to a diet that was rich in nutrients and relatively low in calories, with little fat in particular. They had bananas, papaya, beets, peanuts, rice and wheat, among other types of food. On the positive side, this type of diet had a positive effect on their health in general. They all showed improvements in various indices, like a lower blood pressure, lower blood cholesterol, or an enhancement of their immune systems. But still, the problem of food availability in such a closed system cannot be ignored. It took a farming area of 27,000 square feet to feed eight people sustainably. And this agricultural area was very highly productive, up to five times more productive than regular farming of similar crops on Earth, thanks to the care taken and the optimization of everything, from the quantity of water to light and the quality of the soil. If it took that kind of surface to feed eight people, just imagine how much would be needed for hundreds. Here again, facilities could be made more compact inside a spaceship, maybe with algae or fungi farms to produce nutrients. But like for oxygen, it suggests that a generation ship would need to be a gigantic, huge, if it was to contain several hundred people. All in all, the biological balance here suggests that it could be feasible, 
even though it is complicated. And in space there would be yet another factor that Biosphere 2 could not simulate. The energy factor. Biosphere 2 had a free solar energy, something that could be available in a space station close to a star, but not in an interstellar ship traveling between star systems. For most of its journey, stars would just be uh, tiny points in the sky, and it would be in the dark. So, in order to maintain an ecosystem, artificial lighting would have to be provided, supposedly via the same energy source that would power the ship's propulsion. Assuming a lasting and very efficient source of energy can be used, like fusion energy, this also looks feasible, but complicated, and fusion reactors are still experimental at this stage. Other challenges of a different nature would be societal. How do you make tens or hundreds of people live together and stay focused on a goal for possibly several generations? The first passengers would have chosen this life, but not their children. And this raises ethical, but also social problems. We don't have examples of group dynamic, large groups, confined inside a closed space. Such things may have kind of happened on Earth along history. For example, people living on an island, isolated from the rest of the world for a long time, but their interactions were not studied, and the conditions were also very different. They didn't need, as a group, to keep a complex spaceship functioning in the void of space, which can only be achieved through cooperation. The only documented experiments we have are with small groups of less than 10 people, like the Biosphere 2 experiment, or groups of scientists who spent months together in isolation in polar bases in these different cases, the groups were completely cut from the rest of humanity, physically separated. And these groups needed to collaborate to ensure the success of their mission. The results are generally not very encouraging. In most cases, and that was the case for Biosphere 2, conflicts appeared quickly not after years, but just after months. Factions formed, and people who had entered the mission as friends became enemies. And this, despite uh, all the participants being responsible adults and having been uh, psychologically evaluated before. This is maybe not inevitable, we don't have enough experiments of that sort to conclude that every single group will dysfunction. But it shows that the risk is real, and it is something that experts in space agencies preparing crude missions that could last months or years, for example to Mars, are seriously thinking about and anticipating. Now, arguably, the group dynamic of a small group of half a dozen to ten people does not necessarily reflect what could happen to a larger group of more than a hundred people. Staying confined with the exact same six or seven strangers in a small space is not the same as staying with a hundred different people because in a case like that, you can at least avoid the people you dislike or are in conflict with. But the truth is we don't really know precisely how a group could evolve and behave years or decades after departure. 
the sense of purpose that would uh, probably prevail at the beginning of the journey could weaken, especially when people know that they will die of old age before reaching destination. And the transmission of this commitment to the journey, to the mission, to the children born in space is far from obvious. Maybe it could be easier if the second generation can hope to see the destination planet. Because they could project themselves into another life after the mission. But if the journey is longer than that, and their fate is to die on board, the absence of purpose could make them revolt and decide to abort the mission, go back to Earth, go somewhere else, or maybe kill themselves out of despair. There is no easy ways of anticipating this. Social breakdown looks like a serious risk. There could be mutinies, infighting, changes in the organization of this small society that are unpredictable and cannot be avoided with codes of conduct or social engineering when, ultimately, the travelers will be left to their own devices. And then, there is the ethical question of knowing whether it is acceptable to lock future persons who are not born yet into a project they didn't choose. The existence of intermediate generations those generations destined to be born and die in space raises an ethical question. They would be literally used to work and reproduce with very little agency on the course of their lives. Is it more absurd than being born on Earth and also living with constraints? That's a deeper philosophical question, maybe. But arguably, Having to spend one's life confined to a spaceship with uh, relatively few people and uh, limited possibilities to define one's life purposes, the only option would be to accept what was decided for them. This looks like a severe denial of liberty, and the constraints would be many, the obligation to work, the control of births too, the number of adults and children would have to be monitored, the formation of couples may have to be decided by others. It would have to be a lot. But, by the way, how many people would have to embark for this traveling society to be able to survive? Because genetic diversity would have to be maintained along the journey. An anthropologist, John Moore, estimated that it would take a minimum of 160 people boarding if the journey was to last around 200 years. It could be less if the journey was shorter, and it would have to be more if it is longer than two centuries. These estimates of the necessary population do not take into account a severe population catastrophe over the course of the journey. In such a controlled environment, and assuming no unwanted pathogen comes on board before departure, an epidemic sounds unlikely. But an accident would always be possible, a malfunction of systems, an explosion, Many things can happen over the course of several decades or several centuries. Apart from accidents, a major health concern would have to be cosmic rays. The radiation environment of deep space is very different from that on the Earth's surface. Deep space is crossed by an influx of galactic cosmic rays. That is to say, high-energy particles that move through space at nearly the speed of light. 
stars emit these particles constantly. We are protected from them on Earth, especially protected from the particles sent out by the Sun, by our magnetic field and the atmosphere. But in space, the influx is much larger. The metal barrier offered by a ship's hull does not stop them, and long-term exposure to these rays can lead to DNA damage with an increased risk of cancers or neurological disorders. So the ship would have to be shielded from them somehow, or people would need to spend time in shielded pods or rooms whenever the radiation level becomes too high. And finally, yet another social problem would be education, the transmission of the knowledge and know-how to new generations, so that they can rent the ship, but also reach destination still in possession of a cultural legacy from the human civilization. Otherwise, what would be the point? It could be assumed that all the first generation of passengers would be skilled, educated people, scientists, engineers, doctors, teachers, technicians. But will their children be able to replace them well in these roles? There is a degree of social reproduction on Earth. The children of highly educated people have a higher chance of also be highly educated. But social classes or categories are never fully separated. The next generation of engineers will also comprise individuals whose parents were blue-collar workers and vice versa. It is possible to decide that children will occupy functions that require high skills when they grow up but not that they will master those skills. There could be a serious risk of loss of skills, generation after generation. A parallel could be made with these miniaturized ecosystems, the miniaturized biomes I told you about before. They don't really have the exact same properties as the real full-scale biomes on Earth because they are smaller, which makes them more fragile and less stable. Maybe the same could be said of a miniaturized society. It cannot have the properties of a larger society with millions, like the societies we have on Earth. So you see that the social dimension of the experiment would be highly complex, and uncertain. For the sponsors of such a journey, who would stay on Earth, it would amount to hoping that unborn people take on a mission in several decades and do what is expected from them, all this while hoping that this society remains harmonious enough and satisfying enough despite heavy restraints on the freedom of its members, from their confinement inside a ship to the control of their reproduction, or the imposition of tasks they didn't really ask for. Maybe it would take more variety in this society, including choosing people for this mission that do not have directly productive functions but still cater to the well-being of others, artists, entertainers, writers. The social question would be complicated anyway. With all these difficulties, the more you think about the generation ship concept, the more it becomes a headache. But maybe there could be a solution to many of these problems, a kind of magic bullet. What if, instead of making people coexist for such a long time, feed them, make them breathe, educate them, 
and despite all this they could still fail to achieve the mission, what if instead the passengers of the long distance ship were just put to sleep in hibernation or frozen for the duration of the journey? That would make a lot of problems go away. And this brings us to another concept, the concept of sleeper ship. You've seen Alien, Avatar, Planet of the Apes, Event Horizon, or any sci-fi movie in space with long-haul travel of the past 40 years, so you already know what it is. People go inside a pod or a chamber, they fall asleep, or are frozen following an unspecified protocol, and when they arrive, years or decades later even, they wake up. They have not aged or barely. Of course this is fiction, you just don't freeze and microwave people, and sleeping or even hibernating does not stop aging. Hibernation can slow down metabolism, but not suspend it. The suspension of vital signs is biological death, that's its definition. So if we leave fiction aside, is it conceivable one day to create such a process of stasis or cryopreservation that would allow to turn this concept into a reality. As you probably know, people cannot be frozen and survive, be resuscitated, because freezing destroys cells. When water freezes, and we are made of nearly two-thirds of water, the organization of molecules changes, Ice takes more space. Frozen organs, a frozen brain, a frozen circulatory system are damaged beyond repair. And apart from that, it is impossible today to resuscitate someone when all vital functions have stopped for a long time. But is it unthinkable to achieve it one day? Maybe nanobots and undiscovered medical procedures could help achieve it. But that is purely conceptual. We are no way near this. There is a practice called cryonics, which is the low temperature freezing and storage of dead people after they have been declared clinically and legally dead. Businesses offer that since the 1970s. The hope is that one day, these corpses can be brought back to life somehow when science allows it. This is regarded with much skepticism within the scientific community, because even when the bodies are frozen at very low temperature, before putrefaction begins, and with cryoprotectants that try to prevent the formation of ice crystals, the nervous system still gets destroyed by the procedure. And apart from that problem, which has no solution today, this service is offered by private businesses that are not eternal. The first attempt began in the 1960s and 70s, and all but one of the companies that offered cryonics at the time went out of business and their stored corpses were disposed of. So their clients paid a hefty sum of money just to be frozen for a decade or two, and then they were cremated or buried. So, realistically, the complete suspension of vital signs with no aging at all, is not achievable today, but we don't seem to be anywhere near this. A kind of induced coma, monitored by machines that would keep unconscious people alive, 
is much more possible. Metabolism could be slowed down to an extent, which would be a way to slow down aging, at least in parts of people's bodies. This is something uh, imaginable with existing or soon available technology. But this doesn't really solve the problem here. People would still age, they would need to be fed, to breathe, so the ship would have to operate automatically to self-repair, self-pilot, and run all the life support systems without human intervention. If we were able to do that, there would be no need to put people to sleep and monitor them. Maybe they could be offered a life of leisure on the ship, with a minority of technicians to supervise it. So these options look like dead end, but cryopreservation is not completely impossible. It can work with really tiny organisms of a few cells, which allow for such a fast vitrification of the entire organism to happen that the cells and their DNA are not damaged. This is how embryos for in vitro fertilization are preserved. They are frozen at an early stage of development, before their structure makes it impossible, and this is why they are not destroyed and can resume their growth after they are transferred into a womb. This type of embryo cryopreservation has given rise to the concept, the idea, of embryo space colonization. Embryos can be kept in a small space, so a much smaller ship would be possible, no need for oxygen and food production, and the mission would consist of bringing the ship to a destination planet, then have robots build the base, resume the growth of embryos in artificial wombs until birth, then raise the children and form the basis of a new human civilization on another planet. You immediately see some of the requirements. Artificial intelligence, robotics, computer hardware that self-repairs or can function for centuries without failure. It's a lot of technological challenges that would have to be solved. And it is not all. Can human embryos really develop without any human contact? There are biological issues to this. For example, gut flora and many other microorganisms may be necessary for proper biological and immunological functioning. Babies acquire them from their mothers and the environment. So these processes would also have to be artificially replicated. And there is there again the ethical question. Is it morally permissible to raise children without human contact? To create children without parents? And also what kind of culture, values, human legacy should be transmitted to these new humans without a genealogical tree. What would a civilization that starts with high technology levels but without a cultural legacy look like? Maybe with all the technical barriers we discussed tonight, starting from the absence of a clear destination today for such a mission, to the long list of missing technologies, it's obvious that all this remains very theoretical. And we may not need to answer questions that are not even raised. Despite all this, the concept of generation ship continues to be studied or discussed in small circles as a project in universities sometimes. There was one from the University of Munich 
12 years ago, called Project Hyperion. This was a preliminary study of the requirements of such a project, technically and in terms of population size. There are also astronomical societies, like the British Initiative for Interstellar Studies, which also has an American branch, that studies and proposes designs that, one day, maybe, could be used in such a project. This is the end of our journey for tonight. You can now let go and fall asleep or pick another story from my library if you don't feel sleepy yet. I will be back soon with a new one. So, in the meantime, sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.